Sorry, Sarah <laughs> Kelly. Yay. Well, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Amy Souza, and as you heard, uh, I am an activist on this issue. I've done a lot of events. Uh, my background is also in psychology and theater. Uh, and those things coming together have led me to this special specialization in embodiment, and particularly as it pertains to safeguarding. So when I'm talking about embodiment, uh, sometimes people think I'm talking about something woo or new age but I'm really talking about a very practical skill set that we all have. Uh, what I am talking about is the state of being fully occupied at one in and in integrity with one's body, one's sense perceptions and instincts. And embodiment is the foundation for all safeguarding skills. So while it's wonderful, of course, uh, that human beings uh, have this really amazing and well-developed prefrontal cortex that allows us to do all kinds of abstract analysis and computations and conceptualizations, it's often this very capacity that causes us to rationalize ourselves out of our own survival instincts. Uh, like all animals, humans are not born into this world conceptualizing. And like all animals, humans are born into this world as sensing beings. So while newborns uh, don't understand any language, they can't perform even basic math skills, uh, they are already responding to their environment with their senses. Our bodies are an accurate guidance system that leads us towards nourishment and away from pain. Uh, and like all animals, humans are born with bodies that contain all of the instincts that we need for our survival. But unlike other animals, humans are the only species that often teach their young to deny their instincts and to discount their own sense perceptions. And this can lead to massive safeguarding failures. And we see this much around the gender ideology movement. Now, this ideology, where it appears in the media, in schools, in governments, it uses emotional manipulations within language um, and curriculums, and these can interfere with a child's natural instincts and with the accuracy of their pain and pleasure responses and the child's ability to have healthy bodily autonomy and boundaries. Uh, I want to talk today about the use of what I call or what is called empathy traps. I'm going to talk about a little bit about glamorization in the form of publicity and I'm going to talk about how they are used as a manipulation of the inversion of our natural empathetic pain response. And before I go into that, I really want to underscore, and I think uh, those of you who are here will understand this, but what we are witnessing in culture is not the uprising of a marginalized class that has suddenly found its voice. We are witnessing a top-down engineered agenda. Uh, and I'm going to say a quote from an amazing woman named Kay Yang. She is a whistleblower. She's a former trans rights activist herself. She used to work uh, in the New York City public schools for the Department of Health. Uh, she is now a whistleblower on the issue, and she defines this agenda as the collusion between supranatural governing bodies, nation states, the private sector, in tandem with corporations, media, academia, foundations, and nonprofit organizations to actualize legal and social change in the name of trans and LGBT rights that undermine and terminate sex-based protections for females, child safeguarding, and the very binary of sex, male and female, as measurable categories. So that's, that's quite an agenda. Uh, I also want to cite for you um, a 2020 article which Forbes magazine wrote. Now, Forbes magazine published this to encourage everyone to invest in trans tech as a budding industry with enormous opportunity. They said, our estimates place the average cost of transition at $150,000 per person. Multiply that by our estimated population 
population of 1.4 million transgender people getting these surgeries. And we are talking about a market in excess of $200 billion. That is significant. That is larger than the entire film industry. Uh, and lastly, I want to cite Out Leadership, which is the world's premier global platform used by businesses to drive their equity campaigns. Uh, they count 98 of the world's most powerful companies as their clients, and they value on their homepage the total global purchasing power of the LGBTQ plus markets as over 3.7 trillion dollars. Uh, for more on following the money behind this, please look at the work of Jennifer Billick of the 11th Hour Block. Now, I am citing these <laughs> to talk about how these marketing trillions go a long way towards the manufacturing of consent that have helped pave the way for condoning crimes against children, mainly by the creation of publicity that uses cognitive hacks to bypass instincts and natural sense responses. So kids, of course, are primarily uh, and especially vulnerable to this. Um, I often speak about how this ideology creates dissociation. It is an ideology of dissociating from one's bodies. This is in children's books. This is in school curriculum. This is on cartoons. This is on your favorite Netflix program. It is on the newest t-shirt at Target. They use a lot of language of false positivity to emotionally manipulate. Uh, we are repeatedly told that it is of the highest importance to value inclusivity, validation, affirmation, and kindness. Now, of course, all of these values by themselves, these are great values, but they are not benign. They are only uh, useful situationally. So if we're talking about a third grade birthday party, Yes, of course, invite the whole class. That is an amazing time to be inclusive. But when we are talking about safeguarding, boundaries are necessary and boundaries are necessarily exclusive. So these kids in their school libraries, in their school classrooms are reading books like, but I'm not a boy, but I'm not a girl, my gender dysphoria monster, the gender wheel, let's talk about it, a sex guide for kids, and hundreds of other books that are telling them that they can choose to be a boy or a girl or neither or both or some entirely made up identity. They are being led down a path where they are being told they cannot trust their own bodies or they are made to feel that they are something other than their bodies. Uh, they are also led through constant pronoun rituals, uh, whether it is in their anti-bullying curriculum or whether it is in a teacher wearing a pronoun badge or a teacher's anchor chart. Uh, these students are corrected when they use accurate sex-based pronouns pronouns for teachers or other students who claim opposite sex identities. Now, sex recognition. This is a primary instinct. All animals have it. This is evolutionarily honed over millions and millions of years. There are only about five instincts. Fight, flight, sex recognition, sex recognition, food recognition, and sex drive. Okay, now when kids, if any of you have kids, you know that kids go through a language acquisition phase. Uh, they do point and say, or we call it see and say, and they point and they say, mommy, there's a bird. And the mom says, yes, that's a bird. Or they say, daddy, uh, there's a truck. And the dad says, yes, there's a truck. This is a process of authority building. This is a process of naming and claiming. They are not only learning language, but they are learning that their own senses are an authority on the world. They are learning to trust their bodies. This is a process of healthy bodily autonomy. They are learning, I can trust my eyes and my ears to tell me the truth about the world around me. So when teachers correct students, uh, just a few weeks ago in Glendale, I don't know if you all saw this video, there was a developer
developmentally disabled girl who was calling her teacher Miss Cam because she saw that it was a woman. She saw a woman in front of her uh, and she was being corrected. No, I'm Mr. Cam. No, I'm Mr. Cam. Now, this is telling kids that they cannot rely on their bodies as an authority on the world around them. They are telling kids, no, you cannot trust your eyes and ears. This is happening to kids in nursery school, kindergartners, very young kids are being brought up thinking, I cannot trust my body to tell me the truth about the world. So this is a very dissociative process. And ultimately when kids are taught that they cannot trust their bodies, when they do not have bodily autonomy, they are vulnerable to future predation. So kids can't have healthy boundaries uh, if they can't trust their own bodies. Now, through the use of curriculum like the gender bred person, this is the most common curriculum taught in schools. Many of you will have seen this, um, but it doesn't matter if you have not. Uh, mainly the thing is kids are being taught that they are compartmentalized. So in the image and in the writing of the gender bred person, um, they are taught that their identity, their mind is something separate than their body, their sex, and and this is something separate than their gender expression. That all these things are separate and operate separately. So this is another um, dissociative effect. It's a compartmentalization. Um, they are taught the definition of gender identity in the curriculum is one's internal sense of being male or female or neither of these or both or another gender. So uh, that's confusing to me. I am an adult, I've read it many times. Uh, of course, that is going to be confusing to kids. It's self-referential, it doesn't explain anything. What are these senses? What is a sense of being male or female? What is that like? Uh, to me, uh, as an embodiment person, the only senses uh, or feelings that come with our bodies are physical sensations. That's it. The only thing that is particularly female about me is having a female physical developmental process. All the other feelings, all the other senses, those are emotions. Those are open to all humans. Okay, but they are being told you can have a, a sense of what is a male, a sense of what is a female, but they are given no guidelines for what this might be. So you might imagine <laughs> that by looking uh, at the American Psychological Association and their book, which is often called the Bible, um, the Psychiatric Bible, the DSM-5, or the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, that we might find something more substantial. But instead, gender identity is described much the same way as a category of social identity that refers to an individual's identification as male, female, or some other category in between. Uh, where gender dysphoria is a general descriptive term that refers to the distress that may accompany the incongruence between one's experienced or expressed gender or one's assigned gender. So the DSM, I've, I've given you the highlights, but the DSM devotes over 10 pages to the diagnosis of gender dysphoria, okay, but it never differentiates between sex and gender, okay? It doesn't tell you what this sense of a male identity versus a female identity might be. It doesn't say what those are or are not. It doesn't say whether you might have feminine tastes and be a man and that's okay. It doesn't tell you any of this. It has no differentiations. Uh, and the only diagnostic criteria of symptoms that it does provide basically literally boils down to liking sex stereotypes of the opposite sex. It's literally all about stereotypes. Um, I have a longer essay coming if anyone ever wants to read my Substack uh, about taking apart the DSM. Uh, it, it's a real problem, but I'm not, I can't get into it here. <laughs> um, so Here's where I wanna talk about these empathy traps. So uh, there's a great book called The Empathy Trap by Tim and Jan McGregor talking about the relationship between the empath, 
the sociopath and the apath. Now, uh, the sociopath obviously has nefarious plans. Uh, those who are apathetic do not care, but the empath is actually the, the greatest enemy of the sociopath because empaths feel for others. They feel other people's pain, okay? So they are the ones who generally stand up, get in the sociopath's way and say, no, you cannot do this. But the diligent sociopath will create an empathy trap to derail the empath's response, okay? So earlier when I spoke about that manipulative language of false positivity, I mentioned that that was one kind of empathy trap, the false positivity, good values that everyone wants to strive to. Of course, everyone wants to be inclusive. That, that's an empathy trap. Uh, and or we're, we're often told um, we should feel sorry for the poor boy, uh, a.k.a. trans girl, who just wants to be included in sports. And you'll often even hear that these boys are banned from sports. Okay, these things sound so harsh. You, you feel so sorry for this kid. But really, boys are just being told they need to play on the boys' team. Okay, there's nothing happening. It's a trap. Um, but the biggest empathy trap of all is the creation of the diagnosis of gender dysphoria. Okay, because if I ask you, okay, if I just ask a group of people, do you think that kids should have their breasts cut off? Do you think that kids should have their genitals mutilated? Any person with even the slightest empathy would say, oh my God, no, no, of course not. But when I mentioned, so when I, or, or so when I mentioned uh, kids getting their bodies cut, there's a natural empathetic response. We have a pain reflex, we wince, that, that's painful. No, I don't want that for a child, that kicks in, but, when we are told, okay, that these kids ha have an incongruence with their identity, that they are born in the wrong body, that their extreme distress can lead to suicide, well, this is a very effective empathy trap. Uh, and it's also an effective tool to invert our natural empathetic response when it comes to child genital mutilation. Okay, alongside this trap, we also have the glamorization of this mutilation. Okay, to glamour is to cast a spell, to create an illusion that conceals the true form of something. Now, in this case, we see all the time these celebrity images concealing the pain that is actually going on. Kids are seeing models uh, like this woman, Cassiel MacArthur, who has been pictured in Miley Cyrus videos and on Vogue magazine with Madonna, and she's glamorized as this amazing celebrity with her double mastectomy scars. Or we see Jazz Jennings, who has his whole own television show all about him and a penis party where he had a penis removal on this show, very celebrated. Or now Kim Petras, who is being held up as the first ever um, transgender woman to win a Grammy and we see him featured on a, a Sports Illustrated cover. Okay, the reality of the painful, the very painful surgeries that they have uh, gone through are being glamorized. They are being made to appear elite, enviable, uh, confused with luxury and sex appeal and status. So as a result, these images, um, our empathetic pain response is subverted. Instead of associating these things with pain, we associate them with an enviable state of being. Now, this is not a new tactic. This is old. This has been used um, across all cultures and centuries. Um, and I want to uh, give you the example today of Chinese foot binding. Okay, when it first emerged as a practice, it was just for the elite. You know, the the the. the the royals, the, the top families, the top houses. And, but as the practice grew, as it was associated with the status, it began to be seen in the more middle and lower uh, uh, classes. Um, and as with our current practice here of cutting off healthy breasts and genitals of children, in China, the brutality of the practice was minimized. 
okay? Um, there was um, um, uh, euphemistic sleights of hand, like tiny feet or golden lotus feet, okay? These are comparable with our terms, like top surgery and bottom surgery. They're just little cute euphemisms that hide the horror of what is really going on. Um, also, um, among the Chinese, foot binding was universally legitimized, okay? There was a saying, if you love your daughter, you can't love her feet, okay? So think about that. We have today, uh, if you love your trans daughter, okay, <laughs> aka your son, you can't love his penis. If you love your trans son, aka your daughter, you can't love her breasts, uh, or, of course, the one that we do here, literally, do you want a dead child or a trans child? Okay. Um, I can't go into it right now because there's a, a time constraint, but if I could, these same connections can be made with the practices of FGM uh, and breast ironing, both of which are still practiced in parts of the world today. Uh, and... Um, Images, you can go and look at this for yourself. Uh, uh, today in um, the Sudan, in Mali, female genital mutilation is practiced. And they, if you look at the pictures side by side with these new surgeries, there's nullification surgeries now and eunuch surgeries. These are practiced in Miami and San Francisco. And side by side, these pictures are indistinguishable and the uh, negative symptoms and um, complications of these surgeries are exactly the same. So we could ask ourselves, why is FGM wrong when it's in North Africa, but right when it's here? Um, also, FGM, just as a side note, FGM is a feminizing surgery in these countries. It is being used to feminize girls. Their, their clitorises are seen as a, as a little penis. So why is their feminizing surgery wrong on little girls, but we do this feminizing surgery on little boys and cut off their genitals? It's so wrong. Um, so to get things wrapped up, our human capacity for reason can be used for good or harm, okay? Uh, the reasoning required uh, to justify these mutilating, mutilating the bodies of children is not sensible, okay? It literally cuts us off from our empathetic sense response, and it literally cuts kids off from their sensing bodies. We need to meet this ideology value to value. Okay, this is a value of disembodiment, dissociation, compartmentalization, objectification. We need to meet this with the values of embodiment, trusting your instincts, trusting your sense perceptions, having bodily autonomy. These are the tools that kids need to inoculate them from this concept that is infecting their brains. So I hope that uh, you will walk away with uh, understanding a bit more about that. And I really appreciate you. Thank you for letting me speak to you today. Thanks.